Welcome to the second chapter of OptiView's webinar series, How to Master OCT and OTTA. Today's course is led by Dr. Julie Rodman of Nova Southeastern College of Optometry. Dr. Rodman will explain how to utilize OCT and geography to detect and manage age-related macular degeneration. If you have questions, we encourage you to type them into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen, and Dr. Rodman will be happy to answer them at the end of her presentation. Dr. Rodman, please take it away. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you all so much for coming out tonight to join me for this webinar on how we can maximally utilize our OCTA in the management of outer retinal disease. So as Angela said, I'm Dr. Julie Rodman. I have the pleasure of teaching at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in the Sunshine State, and it's my pleasure to be the host for this webinar. So I'm going to kind of break the webinar into two parts. The first section, I'm going to go over how I interpret OCTA images. And then in the second part, I'm going to actually present some clinical examples, putting my step-by-step -step interpretation into action. So let's jump right into this. So really, to begin any lecture on angiography, I kind of like to give a little bit of a history of where we've been with OCT and where we're headed. So in the early 2000s, time domain OCT was introduced, and this was really huge for optometrists because for the first time, we were actually able to visualize structural abnormalities non-invasively. But when you look at the image on the bottom left, you can see that there's a lot of pixelation and obscurity to the image. And it was really difficult to tell if there was artifacts or if we were actually seeing a true abnormality. So a couple of years later, spectral domain OCT was introduced. And as you can see on the middle image, the resolution was really, really much, much far superior. And it, it really took a lot of the guesswork out of the game. But you have to understand that these technologies only provided structural information. There was a missing piece. We weren't able to look at the vascular supply or the flow or how much nutrition was getting to the retina and choroid. So a couple of years later, in 2014, OCT and geography was introduced. And this was kind of that missing piece because as you can see on the image, now we're getting visualization of the vascular pattern to the retina and choroid. So I think the question that I'm asked most often when I do these lectures is, Dr. Rodman, I've been practicing for X number of years without angiography. Why do I need it? And, you know, my answer is that if you're practicing optometry with OCT, then every single day in your practice you're probably coming across a B-scan that's tricky. What I mean by tricky is you look at it and you can't decide, does this patient have a CNV? Does this patient have something going on, maybe it's diabetic retinopathy that's causing the, the patient's vision to be decreased, something that you just aren't sure of and you want that extra piece of information, this technology is going to give it to you. So in turn, it's going to, number one, allow you to keep more patients in the practice because perhaps you were going to send something that you really didn't have to. And it's also going to allow you to educate, to refer with much more expertise. You're going to be able to tell somebody, this is why I'm referring, and you can refer with confidence. And honestly, probably the most important thing is that you're providing this state-of-the-art technology to your patients. God, I would want to go to you know, a physician that had the highest level of technology available to really diagnose and manage my condition. So what do you get with OCTA? So OCTA is always going to provide your angiogram alongside your B-scan. Your B-scan, which is a picture on the bottom, provides a stationary image. What that means is that if you were to take sequential images of a patient in rapid succession at the same location on the retina, because that tissue is stationary, these images are going to look identical. However, with OCTA, we're imaging the movement of red blood cells through a blood vessel. So because there's movement involved, if you were to, again, take rapid successive images at the same location, those images are going to differ. The way I like to tell my students to think of it is to think about a waterfall. If I were standing in front of a waterfall and I took successive images of that waterfall, each successive image is going to look different because there's water, there's something flowing, something different between the images. So really when you're looking at the angiogram alongside the B-scan together, you're going to get the ultimate visualization that you can structure along with function. How does it work? Again, it works on a motion contrast system. You're going to take two sequential images, B-scan images that you can see on the left-hand side. The machine is going to look for subtle differences in signal between those two B-scans. Any difference in signal is going to be interpreted as flow. Flow is going to be represented on that middle picture we call the B-scan with flow overlay image. 
anywhere that you see red pixelation on that scan is a place where the unit has found a difference in its signal between the two images. It really means there's flow there. So what you're seeing on that scan is that the inner retina has a lot of red, red pixelation and the choroid has even more. Those areas should have blood flow. Those areas are vascularized. Interpreting OCTA is learning to understand where on the B-scan there should be flow and where there shouldn't be flow. From this B-scan with flow overlay, the angiography is created. On-FOS cusps are taken on that B-scan in a coronal fashion or an on-FOS fashion, creating angiograms that correlate with the level of, on the B-scan or the level of retinal anatomy that you're cutting through. So this is a depiction of the retinal anatomy in the center. And what you can see here is that each section of the retinal anatomy is perfused by a certain plexus. So the most superficial part of the retina is perfused by what we call the superficial capillary plexus, which is essentially made up of the inner limiting membrane to the inner plexiform layer. All of the white vessels that you see on that slab are vasculature. The black circle in the middle is the foveolae vascular zone. And what you see is this centripetal pattern, this centripetal fashion of blood, blood vessels surrounding that foveolae vascular zone. As you go more posterior, we're going to hit the area called the deep capillary plexus, which essentially feeds the inner nuclear layer to the outer plexiform layer. These vessels, as you can see, are more truncated, they're shorter, and they're more condensed around the foveolae vascular zone than in the superficial plexus. As you head more posterior, you're at the area surrounding the retinal pigment epithelium. We call this the outer retinal zone or the avascular zone. Again, outer nuclear layer to Brooks membrane. What you'll notice on this lab is that it's completely absent of vasculature, which makes sense because your RPE is an avascular tissue. So we should not expect to see any white on that slab. If you do, then it may be an artifact or there may actually be an area of abnormality. The last slab, which is your most, the, the slab that feeds the most posterior section or the choroid is your choriocapillaris slab. This slab should be a white homogenous spongy layer because the choroid is made up of all blood. So I always tell the students when you're learning angiography, you have to remember what the normal angiography pattern looks like because if you don't, you're not going to recognize abnormal. So as you can see here, you're always going to have your angiography scan alongside a B-scan. On your left, you have your superficial plexus. And what I want you to notice is that on the B-scan, there is a red and a green caliper. Those calipers are outlining or dividing the section that is being fed by that plexus. So you can see as you move further and further posterior, those calipers are moving on the B-scan. That helps to orient yourself where the vascular supply is, is correlating with on your B-scan. So I'm going to get into what I mentioned earlier, how I interpret my outer retinal diseases on OCT and geography. There's probably many ways to do this. Mine might not be the way that everyone does, but it has been extremely effective for me and it's the way that I teach my colleagues and students when I'm trying to teach angiography. So the first step is obviously to obtain the B-scan. When you're looking at your B-scan, you want to see, is this an abnormal B-scan? Well, this B-scan that I put up is certainly abnormal. This patient has a hyperreflective area, which I've pointed to with the orange arrow, and there are two adjacent pockets of hyporeflective fluid with a lot of intraretinal edema. When I see these findings all together, I certainly worry that this patient has a CNV. So let's say I want to solidify my diagnosis, or right? I want to make sure that what I actually think I see is true. So now I'm going to look at my angiography slab. Remember that I want to focus on my two outer retinal slabs. That's going to be my outer retinal or vascular zone and my choriocapillaris slab. So on the bottom right, you can see that there are two hyperreflective areas, one in each angiogram, correlating with that CNV. That, that hyperreflective lacy neovascular frond is the, actually the network. That's how they're visualized on the angiogram. After this step, I want to use, actually, let me just mention this first. I mentioned before that the calipers are extremely important. This shows you that on the outer retinal slab, the green caliper is the anterior boundary of that slab. 
and the red caliper is the outer boundary of that slab. And then you can see on the choriocapillaris slab that both the, uh, the red boundaries are right at the choriocapillaris. So it's important that you're kind of encompassing the entire lesion. You don't want to have segmentation that's cutting through the lesion because you'll miss part of the lesion. And we'll talk about that further on in the webinar. Once you've established what you think is a CNV, we want to look at the B-scan with flow overlay. Remember that flow overlay helps us to see where there's active flow within the scan. So on the left-hand side, you can see this patient has a large serous PED. What you notice is that the red arrow is pointing to a, a space that has absolutely no pixelation within it, no red flow. That means that that is a clean serous PED. There is no evidence of CNV. Our patient, the one I just presented to you, is on the right. Notice where the red arrow is pointing that there is increased flow or increased pixelation right on that hyperreflective lesion, indicating that there is active vascularization within that complex. So after you've done step one and step two, you should have a pretty good feeling whether or not your patient has an active membrane. However, we have to go through two other steps that are going to really really put it into place, make sure that what you're seeing is actually real. I just want to show you two more of these examples with flow overlay before we move on to the next step. On the left-hand side, again, you start with your B-scan. You notice that there is a hyperreflective lesion, and adjacent to it, there's a hyporeflective lesion. So again, I'm suspicious that there is an active membrane. The orange arrow is pointing to an increased area of flow correlating with what we suspect is a CNV. The last step or the third step is to look at the angiogram there and you can see that there is a neovascular frond that is correlating with that area. On the right hand side, we have a very large area of hyperreflectivity, again with small pockets of serous fluid. And again, we're suspecting here CNV, lots of flow in that area. And when you look at the angiogram, there is a very large membrane. So the next step is to look for false positives and false negatives. And these, this is super important because I would say that most of the interpretation errors that people ask me about are because of false positives and false negatives. So a false negative means that there should be something there, but we're just not seeing it. So the first culprit for a false negative is what we call shadowing. Shadowing happens when you have a large pocket of either fluid or a hemorrhage that may obscure the visualization of the vasculature. So you can see on the B scan here that this patient has two pockets of, or I can call it two okay. serous PEDs. Those serous PEDs are going to result in a shadow. I think it needs another, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me still? So the okay, I'm going to continue here. I hear some background noise. You can see on the angiography scan that there are two areas there of darkness, two areas of shadowing. I'll continue. I'm not really sure what happened there, but I'll continue. So these two, these two serous PEDs are resulting in shadowing on the ONFOS image there. You can see that there is blackness that's correlating with those areas of fluid. Okay, let me keep going here. So that would be a shadowing defect. What we're more concerned about is when you have a B scan that you think has a CNV, but you're not seeing it on the angiography. So let's look at the B scan on the bottom right or the bottom left. You can see that there is a large area of hyperreflectivity with, again, serous fluid adjacent. So we're suspecting here that there is a membrane on this scan. However, when we look at the angiography, the angiogram above the B scan, there doesn't look to be a suggestive area there or a distinct area of CNV. What you can see is a lot of coronal vasculature and a lot of kind of a mess almost around this shadowing. The way you can confirm that there's actually a shadowing defect is you can look at the ONFOS intensity image, which I have with this big orange circle. When that ONFOS intensity image is gray like that, that means that there is a large shadowing effect. And that should be a danger sign because this patient actually has a CNV that is not being well delineated on the angiogram because of the shadowing. So always keep in mind that in patients that you suspect have a CNV and you're not seeing it very well, always to look at the ONFOS intensity image. 
So that's false negatives. False positives are when you think you see something and it really is not, it's not there. Or you think you see, NV, see a CNV, but it's really not a CNV. So look at this B scan. This patient has an area of geographic atrophy. There's a missing area of RPE that I've kind of, I've put in parentheses there. You can see that the PIL is missing, the ellipsoid zone is absent, and this is resulting in increased visualization of the choroidal vasculature. When you have an area of geographic atrophy like this, these large choroidal vessels are going to migrate anterior, resulting in increased visualization on the angiogram. So when you look at the angiogram, that blue arrow is pointing to those large choroidal vessels. That is not a true CNV. So this kind of drives home that point that I said before. You can't just look at the angiogram alone. Because if you looked at the angiogram alone, you would think that that was a CNV. But when you look at it alongside the B-scan, you can see that the B-scan really doesn't have an area there that you're worried about as far as coronal vascularization goes. The other culprit for false positives is what we call a projection artifact. You can see here that there is a mirroring or a duplicity of the vessels from the superficial plexus onto the choriocapillaris slab. So if you just looked at the choriocapillaris slab, you may suspect that that patient has neovascularization. But what you're really seeing is you're seeing this duplicity or this projection artifact coming from the superficial layer. So always make sure if you see these large vessels or any vessels running through the lower slabs, the more posterior slabs, that you always check the anterior slab to make sure that it's not a projection artifact. The last thing that can cause a projection or a false positive artifact is a segmentation error. This patient has a bilobed PED, but when I look at it, it does not look like there's an active membrane there. However, when I look at the angiograms, there certainly looks like there's something suspicious. It looks like a hyperreflexive area. So let's check our segmentation lines. In the first B scan, the segmentation lines are coursing right through the top of the PED. That's resulting in hyperreflectivity or this projection artifact on the angiogram. This is not a true CNV. As we move the lines further posterior, we're still coursing through the center of the bilobed PED, resulting in, again, what looks like a false positive. It looks like a CNV, but it's really not. And then when you put your segmentation lines on the right place, right at the boundary of the PED, you'll see that all you're supposed to have is a shadowing defect because of the fluid within the PED. Here's some more examples. Here's a patient on the left-hand side of the screen who has almost a triple PED with some serous fluid. This would be a patient that I would be nervous for as far as CNV goes because of the characteristics we talked about. You can see the segmentation line is set in the wrong place. It's actually coursing right through the center of the P, the large PED. That's resulting in a large shadowing defect, and it's not allowing us to visualize a potential CNV. However, when you move the segmentation lines around the PED so you're not blocking anything, you can see now how that CNV is, is imaged brilliantly in that, in that blue circle above. On the bottom right is another example. This patient looks like they have some sort of old discoform scarring or some type of lesion there that is certainly hyperreflective in nature. The first image that says wrong shows you how the segmentation line is coursing right through the RPE. You're certainly not going to pick up anything when you're coursing through the RPE. When you move the segmentation lines around the lesion, you can see that there is an old filamentary burnt out CNV there on the angiogram. So now, for the second part of the webinar, I'm going to go through clinical cases. These are cases that I've, see, I've seen some, some have been shared with me, and I'm going to go through how I interpret them. So again, for purposes of this webinar, we're going to discuss outer retinal disease. We want to look at the area above and below the RPE. This is what we're looking at on the B scan, and then the two angiogram slabs. Again, remember, outer retina, choriocapillaris. So there are essentially four types of choroidal neovascularization. I'm going to try to show an example of each. Then we'll talk about CSR and then PED. So this is a 65-year-old Caucasian male who had a history of dry AMD. He came in presenting a decreased vision in his left eye that was only correctable to 2,400. When you look at his fundus image, you can see the classic signs of AMD. 
he has large confluence roots and he has pigmentary changes, he has geographic or areas of atrophy where there's increased visualization of the choroid. But on the B scan, you can see that there are areas, again, here of Drusen. There's a Drusenoid PED, but there is no evidence of CNV. We can see some attenuation to the RPE. We can see some posterior shadowing from that attenuation. But again, there's no evidence of active CNV here. The left eye, which was the area of concern, has large patches, again, large areas of confluent Drusen, areas of pigmentary changes, Again, visibility of the choroidal vasculature. However, is there a CNV? So we look at the B scan and we can see again that there is a hyperreflective lesion that's irregular in contour with an adjacent pocket of serous fluid. So again, we're concerned here that this patient has a CNV. When you're classifying CNVs, lesions that are below the RPE are classified as occult or type 1. Type 1 lesions will only show up on the choreocapillaris slab because they are not penetrating through the RPE, which is now into your outer retinal slab. So looking at this angiogram alongside the, the B scan, you can see that the choreocapillaris slab has a very well delineated neovascular frond there correlating with its occult membrane. And I like to point out that occult membranes do not image well on fluorescent angiography. So you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen that a fluorescein is not highlighting very nicely this image. It's a very nonspecific change, whereas on the angiogram, it's brilliantly imaged that neovascular frond. Here's another patient, 63-year-old African-American male, who we were following for glaucoma. The patient had a vision of 2025. Part of the glaucoma workup was to obtain GCC. When we did the GCC, we got a horizontal and a vertical cut of the retina. The horizontal cut was completely normal. However, the vertical cut showed an area of abnormality at the level of the RPE. You can see there are very subtle changes. There's some hyperreflectivity, some posterior shadowing. And we figured since we have angiography now, we're going to go ahead and get it and see what we find. So here you can see, surprisingly enough, that there's a very well delineated baby little CNV on both of the angiograms. What you're seeing there is a six by six slab, which means that you're measuring six millimeters by six millimeters around the FAZ. It gives you more fields of view, but the lesion is gonna be smaller. If you wanna magnify that image, you can go to the three by three, and you can see how much more, you know, how you can really illustrate the, the characteristics of the CNV better. And I really always like to say, really look at that B scan. Who would have thought? So since the advent of OCTA, a new term called non-exudative occult CNVs have been created because been created because this is kind of a new entity that was not known before the advent of OCTA. So one of the beautiful features of the OptiView AngioView is the Angio Analytics program. This program is truly a game changer in interpretation of um, OCTA. What I mean by that is something like this. The first uh, feature is what we call a trend analysis. So in this particular patient, we were able to monitor the patient over time. You can see we saw the patient three times over the course of almost two years, and the lesion stayed almost identical in size. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what if you weren't sure? What if you wanted a quantitative evaluation and you didn't want to just guess? Well, Optiv, you thought of that and they have this flow area measurement tool. So what that means is you can actually take your caliper or take your, your mouse and you can outline the actual region in question. This will give you a quantitative analysis of not only the area of the CNV, but the flow area as well. So this in turn will allow for you to monitor quantitatively the size and flow of the lesion over time. So this is one example. And another example of a lesion that actually worsened over time that wasn't treated. So those were two occult examples. Let's look at a classic example. This patient was a 48-year-old white male who had a dark spot in their vision in the right eye. And what I found extremely interesting is that there wasn't a blatant CNV on the fundus photo. So B scan here was really extremely useful. So when you look at the B scan, you can see that again, hyperreflective lesion area of serous fluid. So again, we're suspecting CNV, but the difference in this case is that the hyperreflective lesion is above the level of the RPE, which puts it into a classic or type two pattern. So now we look at our B scan with flow overlay on the left-hand side. 
and you can see that there is an increased area of flow or an increased area of pixelation within that hyperreflective area, again, suggesting active flow. Here's your angiogram. Beautifully illustrates that active membrane. And remember that this is going to look slightly different than the occult membrane because now the outer retinal slab will also be affected because the membrane has permeated above the RPE into the sub the, uh, the hyper. There's really not a way to say it, the area above the RPE. I like to include this case of mixed CNV. Mixed CNV means the patient has occult characteristics and classic characteristics. So again, fundus image doesn't give us very much information about differentiation of the CNV. However, when you look at the B scan on the bottom right, you can see that there are two distinct lesions. The RPE is delineated with the red hashed line. The yellow arrow is pointing to the area above the RPE or the classic part, and the red arrow is pointing to the lesion below the RPE or the occult part. So you can see there, there's a two well-delineated lesions. However, remember that on fluorescein, you can see the fluorescein on the top right, these occult membranes, or at least the occult part, is not going to image well. It's going to be very diffuse. It's going to be not well delineated. Look how beautifully the angiography below in the outer retinal slab is able to capture that fine neovascular frond. So this is extremely useful for retina specialists to look at pre and post treatment because they can actually find the borders and see how well they've been able to contain the lesion. This is the last type of CNV. It's called retinal angiomatous proliferation, or type 3. These lesions differ from the other three CNVs because this lesion actually originates in the deep retina. The reason I mention that is because if you look at the fundus image there, you can see that the blood that's in the fovea is a brighter red than what we are accustomed to seeing with a classic CNV or an occult CNV because these lesions, again, begin in the retina. What you get is what we call retinal angiomatous or a retinal angioma that originates in the deep retinal space. You can see on the fluorescent angiography that that hot spot is that angioma, that hyperreflective lesion that is originating again in the deep retina. When you look at the OCTA, it's extremely interesting because remember that most of these CNDs, not RAP, originate in the, in the choriocapillaris. However, this choriocapillaris slab does not have evidence of CNV. So the way that we would classify this is if you look over on the left to the deep retinal B scan, you can see there that I've circled an area of high flow. That area of high flow is actually the angioma that has originated in the deep retina. And when you look at the slab, the angiogram slab above, you can see how beautifully that neovascular cleft is highlighting there. This membrane is going posterior and it's still visible in the outer retinal slab. You can see the yellow arrow is pointing to it. However, it has not formed, <coughs> excuse me, it has not formed an anastomosis with the choroid yet. So we can say safely that this membrane is not sub RPE yet. However, the risk that happens with RAP is that you can get a retinal choroidal anastomosis over time. So RAP is one of those fun things to image with angiography because you can actually watch how far posterior it's growing over time. The next entity is central serous. Excuse me while I take a sip of water here because I'm losing my voice. Okay, so the next entity is central serous. We've all been taught that central serous is one of those entities that we don't have to really worry about, right? It's the kind of thing that's going to go away over time. And a lot of times that's the case. But when, when CSR and similarly PEDs, when those guys linger around for a while, they can become dangerous. And angiography is extremely helpful in watching for those signs of danger. So this is what I like to call CSR the easy one, because here's a patient that has the classic neurosensory detachment. When you look at the B scan, you can see there's a hypo-reflective area there. There is no evidence of increased flow within the lesion, meaning that there is not evidence of CNV here. The angiogram really confirms or solidifies that because all you're seeing there is shadowing. Remember that when you have a lot of fluid, it's going to block the signal on the angiogram, resulting in this hypo-reflective area. But what happens when you have CSR that doesn't go away? Here's a patient who had CSR for a long time. When you look at the patient's B scan, you can see that the RPE is irregular, 
there's hypo, there's the neurosensory detachment adjacent to it. And then you can see that there is increased flow within that lesion or that area of RPE that has shifted anterior. So we're suspecting there that this patient has developed an occult membrane area of hyperreflectivity below the RPE. The fluorescein angiograms, again, are not going to image occult membranes very well, so they're not very helpful in this patient or in this situation. But look how beautifully the angiogram is picking up this kind of burnt out old filamentary lesion that has probably been there for quite a while. So we don't ever want to ignore patients that have had CSR for a long time because they do have the propensity to develop these occult membranes. And there's a highlighted view of that. The last entity is a PED. So here's a patient of mine who I've been following for a while. He was a 72-year-old Hispanic male, vision of 2030. And I've been seeing him for a while. So when he came in complaining of kind of changes in his vision, I looked really carefully at his fundus. And I noticed here, you know, two things. First of all, he's has confluent drusen, which you can see on the B scan with the orange arrows. But this little orangish area there really looked, troubled me because I hadn't seen it before. And you can see on his B scan again, looks like a large drusenoid PED. But the problem again is there's that little pocket of hyporeflectivity indicating there's some leakage somewhere. So now that we have angiography, we got angiography on this drusenoid PED. And you can see that this patient has a little baby, cute little bicycle wheel CNV there originating in the corridor there, which makes sense because it's, again, below the RPE. It's a occult membrane from a chronic or longstanding PED. Here's two more, or one more quick example of a PED. A patient who has a large drusenoid PED there. And if you're really good, again, little spot of hyporeflectivity to the left of the PED. And again, the PED, it's not clear inside. It looks like it's filled with drusen, but is there something else going on? So we look at the B scan with flow overlay, and we can see there's really two areas within that PED where there's high flow, where my orange arrow is pointing to. That's indicative of the fact, again, that this patient has some type of active process within that PED. And there's the angiogram. One of the other beautiful features of the OptiView AngioView is its ability to use color when you're learning how to interpret angiography to isolate lesions. You can see how beautifully this, this um, color-coded image is illustrating that, that abnormal cortical neovascular membrane. And this is kind of a quick quiz. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I always like to put this up because these are all my patients. These are all patients that didn't yell out to me, oh my God, I have a CNV, but they all looked suspicious for different reasons. So I always like to say to these patients, all of 2020 vision, and how many of them actually had a CNV using angiography? So when you look at their angiograms, A is really the only one that didn't. A had these soft confluent drusen on the B scan, which show up again as choroidal shadowing due to blocking of the signal, but no evidence of CNV. B has what we call chordal excavation, was never expecting that patient to have a membrane. And you can see they have a little baby membrane on the chordial capillary slab. Patient C is the one I already shared with you. You can see the membrane. And then patient D had a really thick RP. It's attenuated. It's irregular. It's modeled. And that patient had a little baby CMV as well. So I, I kind of share this when I say when I do this lecture. The patients like these have humbled me. Because before the admin of OCTA, I never would have suspected that these patients had um, active membranes. And they certainly do. They're non exudative but they're there. And they're worthy of knowing and they're worthy of looking at in more detail. I'm going to spend the last minute or two here just going over the final features of the Angio Analytics program that I, that I started to talk about at the beginning. We mentioned with CNVs how you can outline the lesion. You can monitor it over time with the trend analysis. But the analytics program also has amazing features for diseases like diabetes and other microvascular disease. So in diabetics, we all know that the foveal avascular zone is a hot topic. It's a very high level of interest because the size of the FAZ directly correlates with how patients are really, how they're doing with their diabetes. So this angioanalytics program has the ability to objectively measure, objectively quantify the size of the FAZ, as well as the perimeter around the FAZ. So if you look here, you'll see that the machine will give you a quantitative measurement. Here it's 0.349, that's the size of the FAZ. And it also gives you the measurement of the perimeter. 
the beauty of this is that you can measure these patients over time. So here's a patient that was seen three consecutive years, and the FAZ went from 0 0.171 or, so, or similar, I can't see that very well, to 0 0.3 or bigger. So this patient has had a dramatic shift in the size of their FAZ. And again, you don't have to guess because the angioanalytics program does the work for you. It measures it for you. And this was a great study that was done on how the size of the FAZ correlates with disease severity and diabetes. So again, the smaller the size of the FAZ, the better control the patient has. Look how the size of the <clears throat> FAZ continues to get larger as you go through the stages of diabetic retinopathy. It's very interesting. A lot of people ask me, well, how do you grade your diabetes and do you use fundus exam or do you use this? And I would say that I would probably use a combination. I mean, if I didn't see anything on fundus exam but the patient had an FAZ of 0.3, I certainly wouldn't call it mild. <clears throat> I probably would call it somewhere between mild and moderate based on the combination of my findings. The program also has something called vessel density analysis, which puts a color-coded image of really what we call the, the a, a really a color-coded image of the density of the plexus. What that means is the warmer the colors, the more perfusion you're getting. So the foveolar vascular zone is going to be navy because there's no vascularity there. The area around the foveolar vascular zone should be a nice orangish yellowish color. You can see in this patient, superficial plexus on the left, deep plexus on the right, there's quite a bit of areas of non-perfusion, which you can see with that navy coloration. And again, if you don't want to guess how much, you know, how poorly perfuses this eye, the angioanalytics program will give you a percentage of vascular density, which again, as you can see here, can be monitored over time. So everything has a way, take out all the guesswork, of looking at things and progression over time. The last piece here is kind of the summary slide, which is to me probably the most important. Doctors are busy, and we don't want to take time to shift through multiple screens. This, the beauty to me of the OptiView, OptiView, AngioView program is what we call this quick view report. This quick view report gives you everything that you need to know at a quick glance. On the top, you have your four angiogram slabs. Underneath, you have your B-scan with and without flow overlay. And on the bottom, you have your vessel density map, you have two thickness maps, and you have an on false cut. So if you see something that you want to look at in more detail, you certainly can exit out of this screen and start to play around and move things. But for quick, fast, and easy interpretation, you can look at this slab and make a clinical decision pretty quickly. There's calipers that aren't, aren't on this particular screen, but there's also calipers that show up that you can dynamically move through your B-scans and not be stuck with a stationary image. So really everything you need is available on this, this image. And really, I want to thank everybody for their attention. I just want to mention, as an aside here, that I just published a book on OCN geography. The images are obviously from this unit. Um, I hope that if anybody has a keen interest in learning more about angiography, that you will consider looking more into the book. Um, it's called OCT and Geography, a Case Study Approach by Julie Rodman. And I'm always happy to answer any emails that you may have if you feel more comfortable emailing me. So I'm going to open this up to some questions now. Okay, let's see. So the first question here is, I like what you can see with, FA, with the FAZ with diabetics, but the examples I have showed are very sick retinas. Do you find your management changes at all with the addition of FAZ for your diabetics, or does it just give you more information? I agree it's good info, but does it change your management? And I would say 100% it does, because let's say, again, that you look at a fundus and the patient does not have um, any evidence of retinopathy, but then you go and you look at the FAZ and you're into that 0.2.3 zone. That patient has changes that we are not yet seeing on fundus exam. So we owe it to the patient to say to them, look, you're not doing as well as you think you're doing. That patient needs to have better intervention or better blood sugar control and better communication with the patient's internist. So yes, yeah, certainly, you know, telling the internist the patient's doing phenomenally well, and then you visualize changes like that in the FAZ, it's certainly gonna change the way that I do things. 
Uh, let's see what else. So someone asked now that we can use OCTA to find CNVM much sooner than before. Do you find yourself monitoring some of these patients before referring, or do you refer every patient with a CNV on OCTA? So that's kind of a it's, for, it's an excellent question. It's a, it, there's a two two parts to that. In my experience, the the patients that I have referred out with these non-exudative occult membranes are not being treated as of yet. They are watching for signs of leakage. However, I still feel like it's we owe it to the patient if we find it to refer it. Patients that don't have insurance though and can't afford to go, I'm not as worried watching them with as long as I have this trend analysis just because the history of my patients that have had them have not done anything, have not gotten that much worse. However, if you ask colleagues of mine, they may have different answers. So if a patient has insurance and is willing to go, my answer to you is we owe it to the patient for them to get a retinal consult. Very good question. Also with that example of PED, another question, you have that small area of hyporeflexivity in the occult membrane. When do you decide to refer that out for treatment versus monitoring? They have fluid and a membrane, but you're monitoring with no progression. Um, so those patients I have referred out, the question is, do they go? I refer, again, any patient that has evidence of CNV, I recommend referral. Um, you know, if they don't have insurance, most times they won't go, and I'm able to monitor them over time. And like I said, even if they do go, they're not yet being treated, but I still feel like it's in the patient's best interest to have a referral. How do I differentiate active CNV as versus old burnt out CNV on OCTA from my segmentation error in CSR slides? So there is an, an art in learning how to interpret different forms of CNV on angiography, and a lot of it is on the appearance of the membrane. So these lesions that have very long, what I like to call filamentary, um, bulky stalks are burnt out old CNVs. Um, patients that have more well delineated bicycle shaped or, or C fan shaped lesions tend to have more of an active um, etiology versus, versus the burnt out ones. I hope that answered the question. Um, let's see if there's anything different here. These are all about CNV and when I refer, I hope I answer those. In what type of cases do you find OCTA to be most useful? I think that, again, um, definitely outer retinal disease. So PED, um, not serious PEDs, but drusenoid PEDs that are suspicious. Any CN, any B scan with a suspicious area of hyperreflectivity that looks like there could be a membrane. And then definitely 100% are diabetics. Um, there's, this has been, again, a true game changer in my management of these patients, my communication with internists. Um, and again, early preemptive visualization of findings that we didn't see on fundus exam that we're seeing on these scans is really, it's crazy. And the last one I'll take is again, what do I do? What do you tell a patient if you find an early CNV on a scan? I tell them exactly what I would tell a patient that had, you know, AMD or anything else, but there is an abnormal um, vessel that we see on this very, you know, new technology, and we're going to refer them to a specialist to take another look at it to determine if any intervention is necessary and that they should be, that they're lucky that we found it at the stage that we did so that in the event that things change, we'll be able to catch it before anything gets much worse. So, again, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, please reach out to me if you have any further questions on my email, and please consider, again, if you're very interested in this, purchasing the book. It has awesome cases, case examples, and hopefully will answer a lot more of your questions.